Hi! Hi! Yeah, primal scream! Like, yes! Did you just yell? Yeah. Woo! Okay. So we're gonna have some fun. I know you're all, you all took a midterm, correct? Yeah, okay. So like, do this, like, just like, yes, okay. Take out your phones, iPad, laptop, whatever you have. We're gonna, um, hopefully the session's gonna be interesting and engaging and fun after what you just went through. If you have a phone, I want you to text the phone numbers 22333, okay? Like you're dialing a friend, 22333. And then in the text, law, RWU. And you should get something like this if you're texting. Anyone having issues? Are you with me? Thumbs up? Like good? If you're having an issue, just go like this so I know how many people are having issues. Yeah. If you are online right now, hand up, just so I get a sense of how many of you are on poll everywhere. Okay. So hand up means that you're engaged through text or the website? That's pretty good, that's pretty good. Raise your hand if you need another 10 seconds. Yes, Debbie. We're waiting for you. <laughs> Make sure there's no space. Law, RWU is one word. That could be an issue. Do you have AT&T? Yeah. Okay. If most of you have it, that's good enough. The rest of you can play along um, in your heads. Okay, let's test it out. For those of you who are able to participate, let's test it out. Come on, A. Come on, A. Go, A. Go, A. Go, A. Go, A. Go, A. Go, A. You can do it. Okay, we like Cranky. We can work with Cranky. We're used to it. I get the cranky, sleepy crowd. Okay, so you'll notice there's candy going around, and that's because we want you to not be sleepy. We want a little sugar high while you're in here. We don't want you to be cranky. We want you to stop thinking about your crim law midterm and think about the cool part of law school, which is experiential ed. Okay? Crim, gone, gone, gone. Out of your head. Experiential ed, yay! Good stuff. Okay, all right, so we're gonna do one more of these. How do you learn best? There's no cranky option on this one, okay? <laughs> All right, this is cool. You guys are doing a lot of reading about things, but, and you learn law, reading about it, but you don't learn how to do it until you do it yourself. So that's what we're here to talk about, the part of law school where you get in the trenches, where you roll up your sleeves, where you learn how to practice law, and that's what we're here to introduce you to. And that's because, right, becoming a lawyer is about so much more than you're doing right now, right? You're, you're in doctrinal classes, you're in legal practice classes, and that's right where you need to be right now for the fall of law school, for your first semester. But after that, it's time to get out there and start doing things, because that's how most of you learn best. And to us, that's really the critical part of law school, is getting, getting in the field, really learn, learning, like, how do you listen to a client? How do you make a client feel heard? How do you understand what your client's values are? What they want to do, not what you think is best for them, but what they want out of their legal case. What their values are consistent with their lifestyle and their whatever's going on for them, right? Developing professional judgment. You can't learn that sitting in a classroom, right? What's likely to happen in court? What's this judge like? 
What are your client's chances of prevailing if they take it to trial? What, what are the opportunities you know, for settlement, right? That's all professional judgment. You can't learn that sitting in a classroom. The messiness of human relationships, the ethics, how close you can get to the line without crossing over an ethical line, right? All of that is what you learn in experiential education. And that's what we're here to tell you about today. So you've got a huge uh, panoply of us up here sort of the directors of all of the externship programs and the clinics, and we've got three fabulous, two students and an alum who are also gonna talk to you about their paths and what they've done experientially, okay? Um, so there are gonna be a lot of us switching around this microphone and keep passing the candy around. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Andy Horowitz, who's gonna take us through the next um, little bit. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so, you know, this, this slide is sort of giving you a little bit about uh, the basic philosophy we have here uh, that sort of uh, undergirds all of our thinking about experiential education. So what this slide is showing you is pretty much what we want to talk to you about for the next hour or so, right? You, you see the sort of progression from coming in as a non-lawyer and with some maybe some, but maybe no experience or real connection to lawyering and what it looks like. And obviously at the end of the process, we hope and expect that folks are emerging from the law school experience ready to practice law. And so the sort of the pieces along the way are the things we're gonna spend our time talking about, right? Already in the first year, you've started to get exposed to a piece of what we consider experiential education in your uh, legal practice class, right, where in that class you are placed into the role of a lawyer in a way that you're really not in your doctrinal classes. As you move on through your second year as part of the academic program, there are classes, many of them, that you have, uh, that you can choose from that deal with simulation and role play uh, another form of experiential education, all still within the confines of the law school. At the same time you're on that trajectory, there are other experiences, pro bono experiences, that you ought to start thinking about, particularly as you get into your second semester uh, of your first year, and certainly as we approach alternative spring break, something that many of you should be thinking about taking uh, uh, advantage of. Um, you see at the bottom, there's our Sea Grant Law Fellows Program, which you're gonna hear more about. That can be a curricular activity. It can also be an activity that people do uh, for pay, uh, but a terrific opportunity for experiential ed. And then generally, as you get into the second half of your second year and into your third year of law school, you can be thinking about our clinics and our externships, which are four credit experiences uh, that uh, we'll describe in a little more detail later. And along the way, internships, right? Let's just stop for a minute and talk for the, about the difference between those two words as we use them, so that hopefully the vocabulary doesn't get confusing. An internship is something that one does essentially on a volunteer basis. An externship is a very similar experience, but it is for academic credit and it is handled through a, a series of programs that you're gonna hear more about uh, later today. Um, so, right, this is what I've already started talking about. In your first year, you have your legal practice class. There is a requirement for graduation that you take at least six credits of upper level electives that fall into a category of experiential education. That's a requirement through the American Bar Association as well as our own internal uh, uh, requirement. These are some examples, but they're only a few examples of the very many upper level elective classes that fall into this category. Uh, and then uh, we have these other sort of versions. Again, we're gonna spend time slowing this down and talking about each of them. You know, presumably, that we have a requirement for graduation, that you do pro bono legal work. Most students, every student, of course, does that, but many, many, I would say most students do far more pro bono work in their law school uh, experience than is required by the graduation requirement. We're gonna talk about the Sea Grant Law Fellows, externships, 
uh, and clinics. Uh, those uh, latter three on that list of four are, third, are second and third year uh, experiences. Um, so uh, gonna turn it over and we're gonna talk through the pro bono experiential learning requirement. Right, or is this? Yeah, that's you guys. There we go. Here we Hi. Uh, I'm Eliza Vorenberg. I'm the director of Pro Bono and Community Partnerships. And I'm Susie Harrington Steppen, the associate director of Pro Bono Programs. And we are going to talk to you about one of your graduation requirements, the Pro Bono Experiential Law uh, requirement. And this 50 hour Pro Bono requirement is something that you will all have to complete in order to graduate. So Roger Williams University School of Law is committed to giving back to our under-resourced communities and to instilling in our law students an ethic of pro bono legal service. We believe that by engaging in pro bono service as part of your legal education, you will develop an understanding of this professional responsibility and you will develop a muscle for continuing to do it in your career. So the pro bono experiential learning requirement is rooted in ABA model rule 6.1. ABA model rule 6.1 is the legal profession's way of saying that with the privilege of practicing law comes the responsibility to help those who cannot afford your services. At least 50 hours per year or less than an hour a week is the aspirational goal and one that we hope you all will not only meet, but exceed when you're practicing attorneys. The number of hours is aspirational, but doing pro bono is a lawyer's responsibility. So this statistic is, reflects what we call the justice gap or the access to justice crisis. When people cannot get a lawyer to protect their basic human needs like food, housing, and employment, that's an access to justice issue. Even those who qualify for help for le from legal services organizations based on their income will most likely not get a lawyer. There are simply not enough lawyers providing legal service to low income clients. Because there's so many people right here in our community and all over the country who desperately need legal help and because we have talented students like you and uh, who are not only ready, willing, but are able to help with appropriate training and supervision, the bulk of the law school's work in pro bono clinics and externships is in our low-income communities. I'll now turn it over to Susie. Okay, so each of you will do 50 hours over three years, so you're not doing 50 hours a year, so that's something I hope you'll remember today. So 50 hours over the course of the next three years, and I'm sure many of you are thinking, how am I going to do it? Some of you may already have ideas, maybe you've gone to the street law info session or alternative spring break, but others might be sitting here thinking, how am I going to do 50 hours of free anything over the next three years? So I, I want to quickly describe the categories of the ways in which our students do the 50 hours, okay? The first one is alternative spring break, and many of you already know about this program. It's a really great way for those of you who want to get your 50 hours completed either quickly, you do it during your first year, or want to do it in a condensed way. You can get all 50 hours doing the spring break week, and then there are some meetings before and after, but it's a 50 hour project. We designed that opportunity to make it sort of compact. So that's alternative spring break. And you can do that any, any of the years that you're here. The second way is joining one of our pro bono collaborative projects. These projects, we call it the PBC, that's our acronym. These projects are law school run designed projects. For the most part, we partner law students with community organizations and oftentimes private law firms that want to do pro bono to provide legal services. So for first year students, the two projects in the PBC that you can join are, are, are Street Law and then VITA, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Project. But in your second and your third year, we have a variety of projects ranging from civil legal clinics in our local prison, we have a special education law project, we have a guardianship project, several immigration projects, we have projects that help nonprofits um, incorporate and set up their 501c3 status, the PBC projects tend to be less of a time commitment, but over several semesters. So if you're looking to do a little bit here and there, a pro bono collaborative project probably makes sense for you if you want to work on a project for multiple semesters. 
The third way you can fulfill your pro bono is through a summer internship or an internship during the school year. Not an externship. Remember, externship means you're getting credit. An internship would be a volunteer experience, and oftentimes students will do a summer internship with a nonprofit, with a government agency, sometimes with a judge. All of those count. We've tried to make our requirement broad enough to really capture all the potential interests that many of you may have. So think about uh, potentially meeting the 50 hours through a summer internship. And then the third way is really creating your own project. Each year we have students who come in and say, I want to do this, how do I do it? It's not really an internship, it's just something I feel passionate about. The beautiful part of the Feinstein Center is we're really well staffed and we can do that. Like we can help you actually design a project and in some cases we've turned student ideas into pro bono collaborative projects, okay? So we have a really broad way for you to meet this requirement and we want to make sure that it fits for each of you. I think this is helpful. This gives you a snapshot of where the class of 2019 did their pro bono. About half, which is sort of the dark blue on the left side of the screen, half of our students completed their pro bono through a law school facilitated project, either alternative spring break or the pro bono collaborative. And then the remaining pieces of this pie show you that students worked for judges. They did government agency work, public defender work. Um, some students even found private attorneys in the private sector who were taking out pro bono cases, sort of classic pro bono. So that's, I, I hope, helpful for those of you who might be feeling a little bit anxious, which you shouldn't, because this is exciting. Um, okay, logistics, and this is important because unlike all the programs that you're gonna hear about this afternoon, all of you are gonna do this, you need to be certified. So before you start any project or internship that you think might be qualifying for pro bono, you need to let us know. And we use an online system called eTrieve. All of this information is on the Feinstein website. You can just go there. There's a wonderful student guide that talks about what counts and what doesn't count. Every rule, every policy you can imagine is on our website. That's really your best place to go to get answers to questions. But just remember, before you start something, you need to log on to this eTrieve system, instructions online, and let us know you're starting. And then there's steps that you need to take at the end of the experience in order to be certified and have it um, show up on your transcript, okay? So two more small points and then I'll move on to the next person. 100 hour recognition. Uh, most students here wind up, I think 55% of last year's class did 100 hours or more pro bono. If you do that much pro bono, you're recognized in the commencement program. So it's important that you report your hours and you're keeping track of your hours. So even if you do alternative spring break or street law, if you go on to do summer experiences that qualify, you wanna keep track of those hours. So there's graduation recognition. And the last thing I wanna mention is that New York State has its own pro bono requirement. It's similar to ours, but it's also different. So if you think at some point in time, and I really mean at some point in time, you wanna be licensed in New York, stop by our office, look on our website. New York has its own pro bono rules and they are a little bit different. I can help you identify uh, an opportunity that will qualify for both. So you don't have to do 50, hour for, 50 hours for New York and 50 hours for Roger Williams. You can find things that qualify for both, but stop by my office so that we can make sure that you're picking the right opportunity. I'm gonna pass it over to Reed Porter, thanks. Thank you, Susie. I'm Reed Porter. I'm the um, senior staff attorney in the Marine Affairs Institute. How many of you guys are Marine Affairs, I want to do this as my career? Yeah, we got some, right? How many of you guys are Marine Affairs curious? Not really sure. It sounds pretty cool and a lot better than, you know, some stuffy old. All right. Um, I'm thinking that what you're, you guys who are Marine Affairs groupies and curious, you're already going to be listening to me. The rest of you should also listen to me as well. Because the Rhode Island Sea Grant Law Fellow Program is not just aimed at people who are wanting to go into this as a career. We have projects that cover a lot of different areas. Um, there's a beautiful word cloud, <laughs> which I made on the internet. And it talks about some things that are marine affairs-y, aquaculture regulation, uh, microplastics. I learned recently that the average American eats five grams of plastic per day, uh, per week, excuse me, which is the same weight as a credit card. So we're gonna be working on that in the next year. Um, but there's also all these other issues like civil rights, environmental justice, um, 
local government and land use law, and we do tons of those kinds of things. So um, it may be that you have a particular interest in an area that, um, that we're working on, even if you don't think of yourself as, as a marine affairs person. So it's great to be interested. It's not required. Um, so what do we law fellows do anyway? We help people make informed decisions about um, ocean and coastal related issues. Um, the, the Marine Affairs Institute is home of the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program, which is one of only four Sea Grant Legal Programs in the country. Um, and as part of that, we're, we're nonpartisan. We're partly funded by the federal government. So we don't do any advocacy. We don't, we're not in court. We're not um, advocating for particular laws or legislation to be passed. Um, and so our role is really to help people understand what the law is and um, think through decisions about what they should do um, given that knowledge. When can you be a law fellow? Well, this is a little bit different from the other um, sort of extracurricular type of experiential education uh, programs that we're going to talk about today. Um, you will be able to apply to be a law fellow starting this summer once you've finished all of your 1L classes. Um, so summer of 2020, um, for those of you who have an outside um, work um, place lined up, great. Um, come back in the fall. Every semester after that, you'll be able to apply to be a Sea Grant Law Fellow, um, and you can do it more than once. Um, in part, that's because we actually pay you. Um, so that's a unique feature of, um, of our work. So you can either get pay or you can get credit for this. Um, and you can, you can do it every semester as long as you have either room in your course schedule or um, Or I forget what. Um, <laughs> um, it is a competitive program, so um, some some people, you know, if you don't get get it the first time, come back, um, come sit with me, come and talk about when it works uh, for your schedule, for the other things that you want to do while you're here in law school. For those marine affairs groupies in the room, there's tons of experiences that you're going to have to figure out what works and when. So um, come and, and talk to us and find out what works for you. Um, once you are a law fellow, you're going to be working on a one specific legal research question for the course of a semester. Um, you, that's a 10 to 15 hour um, per week requirement for the amount of work that you are, are ne going to need to do to, to do that well. In the summer, it can be up to 40 hours. So it depends on the projects that we have, um, what's allowed. Um, you're going to be working on real questions for real outside organizations, but under my guidance. So that means you can ask stupid questions and I won't judge you. Um, and the clients will, won't have to hear them, but they get all your brilliant ideas at the end. So you can look really good. Um, and, and in the course of that, you're going you're gonna to develop your legal writing, your legal research, your um, real world problem solving skills, and also presentation skills. So it's a great program. Stop by. Come see me, and uh, I'll answer any questions that you have. OK, so the next segment we're going to talk about our very extensive array of clinical externship programs. So uh, again, the word externship means these are programs that we offer for academic credit, right? So. Um, what's the basic definition of a clinical externship? It means that you as a law student are placed in some external office, not working inside the law school, which is what our clinical programs look like, but outside in a judge's chambers, in a public interest office, in a government office, in a corporate counsel legal office, right? A whole variety of programs that you're about to hear about. Um, each of these programs has a component that has a two-credit seminar that is a mandatory part of the experience. That seminar component is taught by a full-time member of our faculty, uh, and that seminar brings together uh, the entirety of the experience, sort of uh, makes the connections that make it an academically oriented and rigorous experience while your field work is out working with another lawyer or another judge 
with that other lawyer or judge being the uh, supervisor of that field work. Um, we have a variety of these programs. Some of them run over the summer. Uh, some of them run only in the spring semester. Some of them run in fall, spring, and summer, right? So we'll probably touch a little bit on that. Uh, there's also a, a prospect of doing, at some point in your legal career, an entire semester, a semester in practice that is devoted entirely to an experiential externship program combined with the seminar uh, for that program. Okay, so now we're going to go through each of these individually and tell you a little bit about them, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Nadia Humber. Okay, so I am Nadia Humber. I'm the director of two externship programs, two clinical externship programs, and I'm going to tell you about both of them. First, I'm going to tell you about the Corporate Council Externship Program, and then I'm going to tell you about the Prosecution and Government Externship Program. I am the director of both. So just to get a sense, how many of you are, how many of you are familiar with what an in-house counsel lawyer is versus a lawyer that works at a law firm and works in the business sector? So in-house counsel, are you familiar with what that is? Raise your hands. Okay, so for the most part, I see that you are. So for those of you who are not, when you're working in-house, you are working for a company. You have one client. When you're working for a law firm, um, you're certainly working on different areas of business law, but you have many clients, and you're really more of a subject matter expert for that law firm with many different business clients. So that's the difference. So with the Corporate Counsel Externship Program, what's really great is that you are getting exposed to an in-house counsel environment. Um, it's it's fast-paced, it's sort of, you know, get the job done, really no excuses environment. Um, but it's really great because you get to see sort of active in-house attorneys doing their jobs. And you get to see it from a different perspective. You get the sense of what it's like having a business client um, and really sort of having their priorities at, um, as your priorities, right? So, so you get exposed to, to what their business is and what their business plans are, um, unlike how you, you wouldn't necessarily get that exposure working for, for a law firm. So that's what's really unique about the in-house counsel externship program. Um, so also you get exposed to, to business, right? So it's not just contracts and that sort of thing, transactional work. It's you get a, a exposure to finance, to accounting, to taxes, you know, um, to, to certainly business organizations, that sort of thing. But you really get um, an insider perspective on how the business is run, is run and that is your job to understand that insider perspective. So that's what's really great about the, um, the Corporate Council Actionship Program. Also, you get a sense of who are you in that program, your sort of your professional identity in that space, and if you want to be there versus if you want to work at a law firm um, doing, doing um, business um, type, type work. So some of our, I don't have the clicker, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, so a lot of our students have been doing some really great work at different placements. We have some really great relationships with some very some leading companies, Textron, Gilbane. You can see the different companies here, but um, they're working on you know license agreements with Swarovski and um, and uh, Fenway, uh, as well as contract agreements or construction agreements at Gilbane, with the, which is a construction company. Um, so really great work that they're, they're doing at these very high profile companies, IGT, sort of the head of uh, gaming in New England and beyond. Um, and they're, they're local, they're, they're, um, they're international, so you get sort of real, very large exposure to, to these companies and do so much work, uh, more than I can even talk in two minutes. So that's the Corporate Council Externship Program. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, there's no prerequisites for this program, but what I would uh, suggest to you is to definitely take business-oriented classes. Certainly contract drafting is a huge one. I have never talked to a supervising attorney that didn't say that they really want you to get contract drafting um, sort of skills under your belt before you get to their placement. So that's huge. Um, IP law is huge, um, if you can get that. Um, business organizations, of course. So those sorts of courses will help you. So moving on to the prosecution and government clinical externship program, so similar to what I was saying before, having that one client, um, I direct this program because you also sort of have one client in a prosecution office, you have one client in um, a government office. As a prosecutor, it is sort of the citizenry at large, right, the community at large. And for a government office, it's that unit, it's that department. So we have really great relationships and placements at many of these different um, 
offices, the Rhode Island Attorney General's office, the U.S. Attorney's office, where you have sort of your one client. Um, and we're looking to expand some of these placements, but really great relationships so far and great experiences um, with the students who are there now. So um, come talk to me if you're interested in any of these programs. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Julia Wyman. I'm the director of the Marine Affairs Institute and also the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program. But I also run our environmental and land use externship program, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so I, I saw the hands for Marine Affairs. It was a good group. How many of you are interested in more broad environmental issues, environmental justice? OK, we've got a few more hands. So this is a great home for you, the Environmental and Land Use Externship Program. And it's a great place for those students who are thinking about environmental work as well. Um, in this program, you actually do get exposure to advocacy and litigation. So that's one way that it's distinct from the Law Fellow Program. Um, and also, you are in the in um, a placement, right? Um, so we have several placements already established. Um, we have the Conservation Law Foundation here in Rhode Island. Um, we have the Providence City Solicitor's Office. Um, we have the Department of Environmental Management. Um, and we also have the Rhode Island Attorney General's Environmental Unit. Um, we're open to having more placements. So if there's a land use or an environmental placement that you're interested in that's either here in Rhode Island or potentially in another state, we have some students who are interested in going up to Boston or going to Connecticut, um, come talk to me, especially your first year. We can start to sort of map out how to make that a placement for next year. Um, this program is offered only in the spring, so you want to think about that when you're planning your schedule, and especially those of you who may be considering one of our joint degree programs, um, come talk to me and we can think about how to map out the courses that you need to take here to make all of that work together. Um, so what is environmental and land use? What, what kinds of issues are you going to come across in these placements? Wide variety of issues um, ranging from zoning and land use. So, you know, where in the city of Providence should we plan to put a new building? How high can that new building be? Um, the Attorney General's office right now is working on a suit against big oil um, related to the effects of climate change on the state of Rhode Island. Um, coincidentally, the Conservation Law Foundation is also working on a concurrent suit against big oil related to the climate um, change effects. Um, issues related to wastewater treatment, um, clean water in the state, lead paint, um, and lots of environmental justice issues. So there's a whole different variety of issues that may come up in your placements. Um, in addition to um, the, if you're interested in doing either four credits or eight credits, um, you can do a semester in practice with this as you can with other externship programs. So come talk to me if you're interested in that as well. And you'll also need to talk to Dean Horowitz if that's something you're interested in. Um, and lastly, I just want to touch on what we do in the seminar. So in our seminar, we do work on um, substantive issues related to environmental law and land use law. So we work um, through lots of different scenarios that you may find out in the environmental law practice. Um, and then we also work on issues related to being in your placement and what, what does it look like to be an environmental attorney and how can you become the best attorney that you possibly can be. So I'll be around for the rest of the session. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'm going to hand it to Dean Yelnowski. Thanks. Um, so if your head is spinning, and I know you're in exam mode, I was thinking as I was sitting there, there'll be a little quiz that I've been putting together as people have been speaking. You're going to need to know the difference between an internship and an externship. You're going to have to know what the PBC is. You're going to have to know what the PBELR is. You're going to have to know what law fellows are. You're going to have to know the difference between a clinic and a field clinic. You're going to need to know the difference between in-house counsel and, if there is such a thing, outhouse counsel, which is probably what I would have been. You're going to need to know ETREE. You're going to need to know SIP, which stands for Semester in Practice. You're going to need to know the New York Pro Bono Scholars Program, sometimes known as NYPBS. So um, they put me in here because what I have to tell you is very simple. In the Judicial Externship Program, you can work in a judge's chambers. You will work with a judge. You will work with the judge's staff. 
You can work with federal judges, you can work with state judges, you can work with appellate judges, you can work with trial judges, you can work with judges in some specialty courts, workers' compensation, immigration, uh, bankruptcy court, so you know what judges are, you know what they do, uh, because you're reading their stuff all the time, that's pretty much what you're doing, and that's the kind of work that you would be doing in chambers in addition to getting to see lawyers do what they do so that judges can do what they do. So, thank you, and I'm turning things over to, who's next? Lori back. We put him in for comic relief. Um, so the public interest clinical externship is the one that I teach in the fall and spring and Susie Harrington Steppen teaches in the summer. Um, this is the externship program for you if you want to work directly with low income clients. This is the program where you're working with public defenders, with civil legal services lawyers, with folks doing immigration work at nonprofits. This is the program where you will sort of be uh, able to use a rule, a student practice rule and get, you, you can for other programs too, but get into court and be able to represent clients. Um, this is a big program for using the semester in practice. We've had a lot of students go far and wide um, it, uh, through the public interest externship program. This semester I have a student in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, near the Grand Canyon. Apparently, a lot of college kids go to the Grand Canyon on their breaks and they get drunk and things happen and they get arrested. So he's doing a lot of those kinds of cases. Um, so we learn all sorts of things from our semester in practice students. Um, you're going to hear about the clinics um, in a few minutes, but just if you're thinking, well, if I want to be a public defender, I suppose I should either do the criminal defense clinic or I should do a, a semester in practice um, with a public defender. The answer to that is you should do both because externships and clinics are completely different. In a clinic, you'll be taught by a full-time faculty member whose only responsibility is to supervise and teach you and you're one of eight students. In an externship program, you'll be taught, overseen by a busy public defender who probably has 100 cases, and you're the 101st thing on his to-do list, okay? And so what we do in the seminar is try to make up for that, right? You're getting trained in the field by somebody who's busy um, but is an expert in their field. And in the seminar, we're trying to teach you how do you manage up? How do you get the supervision you need? Um, why, how does somebody practice with 100 cases instead of three cases, right? What's the impact? Why is everybody in court a low-income person? Why is federal court so different than state court or district court, right? We're looking at institutional racism and, and, and uh, the mass incarceration crisis and thinking about the new Jim Crow. And so we're really digging in deep to sort of who ends up in these um, sort of poverty courts, right? Housing court, family court, um, criminal court, why and what can we do about about it. Um, so that's the public interest externship in a nutshell. Um, and I think, oh, um, here's your next poll everywhere. Excellent. Uh oh. Uh, oh God. Oh. Oh God. All right. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna switch. Okay. <laughs> Turning it over to Dean Horowitz again. All right, I don't know if that makes my assignment to wake you up, I'm not sure. Um, so um, we run a specialized version of semester in practice. You've heard us mention it so far that really any of our externship programs can be done in a semester in practice format and uh, can be done not here in Rhode Island. But this is a particular specialized program that we run in Washington, D.C. We have uh, the good fortune of having a former a uh, tenured member of our faculty who left his faculty position to uh, take a governmental lawyering position in the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, and that's where he works in DC. But in the spring semesters, he runs this program for us. Um, so it's a terrific opportunity for somebody who wants to do any kind of an externship in Washington, DC. And that can include government, it can in include an incredible array of not-for-profit organizations that are located in D.C., trade associations, uh, government. We've had people work with Senator Whitehouse. We've had people work with Congressman Cicilline. Um, so 
Much like every other externship program we have, you're in your field work placement. This is a semester in practice, so five days a week you're in this program. And you also meet once a week in a two-hour seminar class that's located physically in Washington, D.C. and taught by Professor uh, Zlotnick. Um, you see at the bottom it says two things. Participation must be approved by me. That is true for all of our semester in practice programs. So if you are considering doing a semester in practice, come to me as early as you can in your planning process because part of what that approval is really about is making sure that you're doing sufficient planning to make sure that all of your graduation requirements are covered, that you're gonna get up to the right number of credits. Uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, the other, so there's the plan early note uh, at the bottom, uh, which is consistent with what I just said. Uh, Professor Zlotnick is always available, always happy to uh, chat, very, very excited about running the program, always looking to uh, recruit new folks. So uh, that's the DC semester in practice program. Uh, new York Pro Bono Scholars, uh, Liza, you, no, yeah. you come do it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so there is this wonderful program that New York developed, I think about five or six years ago, that permits law students in their third year to take the February bar, New York bar, and then spend the following semester, their last semester of their 3L year, providing pro bono legal service in uh, either a nonprofit setting, um, or other settings where they're working directly with clients. It's a full-time placement, 12 weeks, and you start the placement immediately after taking the February bar. The beauty of it is, uh, assuming you pass, which of course you will, um, you can start practicing by midsummer after your 3L year. Uh, you still graduate, you don't actually get your diploma at the same time as the, your classmates, but you walk and you get your diploma a week or two later when you've completed the uh, program. Uh, it's, you can do your placement either in New York or here or anywhere in the country. I think they are starting to have people do placements overseas as well. Uh, the way that we do it here, because our placement, our students have all done placements in other states, mostly New York, uh, we, I teach the class through what's called Zoom, it's video conferencing. So while you're doing your placement, you're also doing a two to three hour seminar once a week for credit. Um, what else do I need to say? I think that's it. Did I miss anything? No. Okay. It's especially good if you It's especially good if you want to practice in New York. Okay. So that completes the section we're doing on our externship, our clinical externship programs. We're now going to switch over to the in-house clinic part of our academic program. So uh, what is an in-house clinic? Um, so the difference between an externship and a clinic really centers around who the attorney of record is in the cases that are being handled, right? So in an externship program, as you've already heard, you go to some lawyer who's got some other job that's not employed by the law school, right? A judge, a lawyer in some other office in some other capacity, that lawyer is primarily responsible for those cases and provides the supervision of you uh, as you're in an externship. That's an externship. In a clinic, we have three what we call in-house clinics. There is one field clinic. This is part of the quiz that uh, Dean Yelnowski talked about. Um, in an in-house clinic, the director of the clinic, so me for the criminal defense clinic, which I direct, is the attorney of record in each case. And that gives us tremendous freedom freedom that a very busy lawyer in an externship setting doesn't really have, um, to really turn over the reins of each and every case and the full responsibility for representing the client to the student. Uh, so 
Obviously, there's intense, su intensive supervision. Um, because this is the full-time job of all of us who run an in-house clinic, we have the time and the bandwidth to be able to manage the caseload and to provide very uh, sort of significant supervision and guidance as you personally are handling the case, personally or in teams in some settings, uh, handling the case or the assignment that is part and parcel of the clinical experience. Clinics, uh, the in-house clinics are eight credits each. They meet as classes twice a week, uh, but it, it, the, it's not considered a separate seminar component. It is one unified, graded, eight credit academic experience in each of our three uh, clinics. The field clinic is six credits and a slightly different model. We'll get to that uh, in a minute. So. One of our three uh, in-house clinics is the Business Startup Clinic. Professor Katie Ahern, who directs that clinic, is presently out on a maternity leave, uh, so I'm gonna uh, take the job of, of explaining to you what that program is about uh, for the next couple of minutes. So this is the place to go if you are interested in transactional lawyering, if you are interested in the prospect of being a lawyer who works with or represents businesses. What the students in this clinic have the opportunity to do is work with startup businesses, uh, generally small businesses, often not-for-profit businesses, and they are providing the, the array of legal advice that folks in that capacity need from lawyers. So, as you can see, they are talking about entity formation. Should we be a limited liability partnership? Should we try and incorporate? Uh, tax issues, governance issues, contract review and drafting. Uh, so again, very, very useful if you're interested in this kind of lawyering or this kind of a program for you to take the class we offer in contract drafting and transactional lawyering. There is a prerequisite you see of business organizations. Really hard to describe to a client what kind of entity they might form if you haven't been exposed to the kinds of entities that exist in the legal world, and that's a, a lot of what you're learning in business organizations. So again, it's an eight credit experience. You would be assigned as a student attorney to work with uh, one or more than one, several, I think often, uh, of these kind of business entities. The Criminal Defense Clinic is the program I run. Uh, so, uh, like the other three in-house clinics, we take up to 10 students each semester. They're with me for eight uh, credits. And they're working predominantly in the Rhode Island State District Court, which is where our state misdemeanor criminal cases are prosecuted and defended. Uh, and in the Rhode Island Traffic Tribunal, which is our statewide traffic court. A lot of what we're doing at the traffic tribunal are cases involving people who've been arrested for driving under the influence and have been asked to submit to a chemical test, a breath test, or a blood test, and they have refused. That is a civil charge in Rhode Island, at least for the first offense, uh, but it carries very substantial penalties. Uh, so we do some of that work in my clinic. Um, we also do uh, uh, the general sort of variety of misdemeanor criminal charges uh, that exist here in Rhode Island. A substantial percentage of our caseload are crimes involving domestic violence. We do a fair amount of drunk driving cases, uh, plain old assaults that are not domestic in nature, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, possession of marijuana over an ounce, uh, some prostitution or solicitation cases, a variety of uh, misdemeanor offenses. When you are a student in my clinic, you are doing the interview of the client. Uh, I'm not there by design, very consciously, because I want you to be able to be the one to form the attorney-client relationship with the client. So my job is to stay out of the way and behind the scenes as much as possible. You do the interview, you investigate the case, because we don't just rely on what the police reports have to tell us. You uh, uh, negotiate, uh, you counsel with the client, you negotiate with the prosecutor after you've figured out what the client is and is not interested in, or whether this case can be resolved without going to a trial. And if the case needs to go to a trial, we try it. And when I say we, I mean you with me sitting next to you, sort of maybe jabbing you in the ribs or passing notes and occasionally calling a timeout. 
The overwhelming majority of the trial work that we do in the criminal defense clinic is in front of a judge, not in front of a jury. So that gives us a little more freedom to sort of the judges are aware of what's going on and, and give us a little latitude when we need. Um, but it's, you know, it's a terrific way to begin to practice law, to really be the lawyer in a case under a very guided, heavily supervised scenario where we're making sure that the clients are very well served. And in fact, I always feel confident that our clients are in fact very well served. Um, there is a prerequisite for the criminal defense clinic. You need to have taken trial advocacy uh, before you can be in the program. And our third clinic, I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Debbie Gonzalez, to talk to you about the immigration clinic. Thank you, thank you. I'm Deborah Gonzalez, I'm the director of the immigration clinic. Um, who cares about what's going on at the southern border? Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah, that's right. Everything that's going on at the southern border is an injustice, and we at the immigration clinic are doing everything we can to fight that um, with the people that are either living here or are actually at the southern border. Um, I just received an email today asking for help for us to fill out um, asylum applications over the weekend. I don't know that we're going to be able to do that this weekend, uh, but maybe next. Um, so a, a lot of the work that we do at the immigration clinic is representing um, indigent immigrants who can't afford a lawyer and like in criminal cases, although immigrants have the right to a lawyer, they don't have the right to a free lawyer. Um, and we are, along with the attorney at the um, Immigrant Coalition, the only organization in the state of Rhode Island that provides free services for immigrants in removal proceedings. So we need your help um, at the immigration clinic. Students at the Immigration Clinic do just about everything that Andy just talked about in the Criminal Defense Clinic, except we do it in the immigration context. So at the Immigration Clinic, um, I treat it as a law firm. You are my law associates. I'm the senior partner. You're the one meeting with the client. You're developing the strategy of the case, the theory, the client's goals, preparing pleadings, going to court, making arguments, um, talking to trial attorneys who may not always be Nice, but you know, that's what we do. Um, it's okay, Amy's laughing because she's in my clinic now, so she's suffered a couple of trial attorneys who haven't been so nice, uh, but she's a, a trooper. Um, so you'll be doing all of those things. There's a class component, there's no prerequisite. I'll teach you everything you need to know while you're at the clinic. Um, you'll also have a community service component. So at the immigration clinic, law students go to the Wyatt to do uh, consultations with the detainees that are in there. It may mean that we take the case, it may not. So it, what we're really doing is just doing a consultation and trying to figure out one, is there a claim? And if there's a claim, can we take the case? And if not, can we find somebody to do it? And we work in uh, conjunction with the Immigrant Coalition um, which is a coalition of 30 NGOs in the state of Rhode Island working um, for the benefit of um, the immigrant community. And through the coalition, we got DACA legislation passed um, in the state of Rhode Island. So there's a lot of great work being done um, with the coalition and with our clinic as well. One of the other things that immigration students do in my clinic is to collaborate with the Rhode Island PD's office. The Rhode Island PD's office does not have an attorney that does um, Crimmigration consultations, right? So when there is a, a defendant who has a criminal case or a criminal component or an immigration component to their case, they don't have anybody um, to do those consultations. The law students at the immigration clinic actually do that work, so they will be working in conjunction with the PD's office um, in Rhode Island to figure out what are the consequences of a certain plea for whatever the um, criminal case might be, and also taking into account any past criminal history that the client may have. Um, it's really sexy work, I hope you join us. <laughs> okay, so I know you'll be excited to learn this is the very last of the programs we're gonna describe. Um, you're here. The bad news for you today was there was a lot of stuff to go over, but the good news for you today is look what an amazing array of opportunities we have for you. And that's something that, given where I come from, that's just something I'm very proud of. So, Professor Wiener can't be here because she's actually teaching her class in the Veterans Disability Field Clinic right now. Um, 
So this is what we call a field clinic because it's a bit of a hybrid between a clinic as we've described it and an externship as we've described it. Dana is a Roger Williams alum, a terrific lawyer who works full time at a law firm called Chisholm, Chisholm and Kilpatrick. That law firm happens to be located in Providence, Rhode Island, but is the nation's leading firm doing this niche of really important work on behalf of disabled veterans. The overwhelming majority of what that firm does is appeals for disabled veterans who have applied for disability benefits and either been denied or gotten some percentage because they use a percentage basis there. They've been called 25% disabled when in their view they're entitled to a more significant disability benefit. So that's the work the firm does. It's I think the fourth largest firm in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, Dana is a lawyer in that firm, but she runs this program for us as an adjunct member of our faculty. So it's got that combination, the reason we call it a field clinic, it's not located at the law school like our other in-house clinics, and the director is not a full-time member of our faculty, she's an adjunct member of our faculty with a different job. On the other hand, she is the attorney of record in the cases that you are handling. Right, so in that aspect, and she's also the person who teaches the seminar component of the class, in that aspect, it looks and feels like a clinic. It's a terrific experience for people who want to help veterans, for people who are interested in appellate law, because it's an entirely appellate law experience, or for, and or for people who want to get a sense of what a significant law firm looks like and feels like because in this program, that's what you're doing. You're placed in this law firm and you're getting a sense of how that firm operates and some of the law firm culture. Okay, so that's uh, the Veterans Disability Field Clinic program. You want me to flip it or you want to flip it? You flip it. Okay, and I'm gonna hand things off. Oh, that looks rough. Doesn't matter, just do it anyway. What? All right, so, all right, yeah, it's rigged. Andy said it's rigged. Okay, so we are coming to the best part. This is to keep you awake. So I'm gonna ask the, our students and one alum to move their chairs to the middle. This is the best part, okay? Um, and I have really good news for you. We are running ahead of schedule. Ahead, ahead of schedule. And if there's any candy left, start passing it around or bring it back up here. That's all I have to say. Okay. So, um, we have a fabulous panel of students um, and one alum who are going to talk you through different paths and how they've used experiential education, okay? And we are going to do this quick, down and dirty, and then we'll have some quick time for questions and you'll be out of here before, uh, before 3.30, I promise. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Amy. Um, I'm gonna question Amy and we're gonna bring up other professors to question the other two. So Amy, who are you, where are you from, and why'd you come to law school? Uh, my name is Amy Greer, I'm a 3L here, obviously. Um, I'm a New Englander, I've lived in a lot of states um, in New England. And, and why'd you just, why, uh, why law school? What was the plan? Law school, um, I worked for a long time before deciding to come back to law school. Um, so there's a lot of reasons I'm here, but basically it's because I wanted to be able to be a more direct advocate for the community that I had been serving um, as a public librarian and as a policy advocate for many years before. Tell us how experiential ed um, has enhanced your education at Rush Williams and what you've done. Okay. Um, Experiential education has absolutely enhanced my experience um, for two major reasons. The first was I had a general idea that I wanted to do either more public defense oriented work or civil rights oriented work and I wasn't quite sure where I would fit. So experiential learning gave me an opportunity to test the waters and see what I thought of these different ways of serving. Um, and the other piece of it is it gave me a chance to figure out 
uh, well, I should say, I knew what I was passionate about, but I wasn't sure how my strengths could best be used to serve. And so, um, I also used experiential learning to have a chance to see what my strengths were and, and how I could be um, uh, the most effective lawyer that I could be. So the way that I did that was um, first, uh, first year, second semester, I did alternative spring break. I worked for um, a civil rights project at PRISM and um, found myself involved uh, in a police brutality trial um, at the Rhode Island Federal District Court in front of Jack McConnell, uh, Judge McConnell, excuse me. And, um, and so I had a chance to help out there, uh, which was a great experience to test my civil rights um, mentality, see what I thought. It wasn't quite the right fit for me. Um, and, but so I, over the summer, I tried a holistic public defender office as an internship came back from that, still not quite the right fit. Um, and so since then, I have been able to um, join the immigration clinic with Debbie, which is an amazing experience. I highly recommend it. Um, learning about law, like really complicated law that's changing literally every single day. Having to stay on top of it because the stakes are our clients' ability to stay with their families and their loved ones and to have rights in this country. Um, and so it really makes our learning mean something. So you're learning at a high rate of speed. Debbie's an awesome professor, super rigorous. It's hard work, but at the end of the day, you can better serve your clients. Um, so I really appreciate that opportunity, and it gives me a chance to, to figure out what I think about being a super nerd, but also a super advocate in the immigration court. So I found a niche there. And the last thing I'll say real quick is, as a 1L, I did street law. Um, it gave me a chance to get out into the community, to hang out with young people, which is one of my favorite things to do and to remind myself who I'm here to serve. Um, it gave me a chance in the grind of 1L year to remember why I'm here when it feels like, well, you know what it feels like. Uh, so, and then second year I continued on to be a mentor in the street law program. So I highly recommend that as a 1L. It's a, not a heavy, heavy lift, but it's a chance to remind yourself why you're here and it's a shining light amidst you know, so, yeah. Um, Amy, what are you doing in the spring? Oh, I forgot. I'm a New York pro bono scholar, so I'll be taking the bar in February. Um, yeah, so that's happening. And then, but then after that, once I survive that part, then I'm going to be in um, Virginia at the Northern Virginia Capital Defender Office. Um, capital defense is what I would like to eventually do. I did it this past summer as an internship um, with the public interest. Um, scholarship stipend, public interest stipend, and, and that was sort of post-conviction work. So next spring I get to be at the front end of the work on the trial end. So I'm Bree, for those of you guys that don't know me, I'm also a third year here. Um, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. I decided to go to law school. It's actually been my plan since the fourth grade. I'm not being that dramatic person. It's literally been my plan since fourth grade. Um, I actually sent applications and letters to Yale University, Roger Williams, um, when I was in the fourth grade to tell them I was coming when it was time for me to come. So I've, I've always planned on being here. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how, has school, how has law school been for you, and why did you come to law school? Um, my, re my background is in entertainment business, so theater, music, um, those are all the things that I grew up doing. My master's is also in entertainment business. Um, I specifically wanted to go to law school because I knew that there were injustices happening with, throughout the world, especially for people that look like me, uh, people that are of different color, of brown skin, specifically about black people. Um, but for me, it was black people in the industry. I saw that there were a lot of things that they were being mis mistreated when it came to their contracts. If they were a musician, if they were an actor, they weren't getting paid as much, they weren't getting jobs as much. Um, that wasn't okay for me. Um, I started off as an actress, as a singer, as a flutist, a pianist, um, and then I decided to go the other route and said, I think my people need me more than I need to be doing this. I don't need to be another person on stage dancing in front of a bunch of people. I need to make sure my people are getting paid like they need to be. Oh. So since coming to law school, have any of your views changed? Has it impacted 
still want to do the same thing. <laughs> um, I've participated in a lot of different uh, programs, going through criminal defense, um, criminal law classes, all the classes that you guys have. I've learned a lot of different things, but I've learned how to apply those things to what my interests and what my passions are. Um, the experiential learning definitely has helped a lot with shaping exactly where I want to go. Um, I never really thought about, I always wanted to just do contract drafting. Um, law school has put me more on the route of trademarking, uh, copyright, and patent law, which I've been finding now is more of my interest than I thought the contract drafting would be. Can you tell everyone a little bit about the different programs that you're involved with? So first year, I participated in VITA. Um, that was my first time doing pro bono. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do that is because I wanted to still stay on the business route, but I wanted to get into the community. Um, I think, honestly, that might have been one of, huh? Oh, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program? I did it. <laughs> um, and then my second year, I was uh, a program leader for that. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because I was helping people in Providence within my own community that needed help doing their taxes that didn't know how to properly do them. Um, when you have clients that are coming in that owe money to the state or to the federal government and they're crying because you've helped them even though they owe money, you did a bang up job. Because <laughs> that is not something to make somebody smile about. Uh, but they appreciate you. And as long as you're doing something that someone appreciates you for, why not? Um, be a part of everything they offer. I'm in business startup, the business startup clinic this year. Um, there's no one here to whoop whoop for my group, so whoop whoop for the business startup clinic. Um, we do copyright, trademark, all the cool stuff. Don't, don't forget about us. Um, and then next semester, I'll be doing the corporate council clinic. Whoop whoop, again, I got you, don't worry. Um, <laughs> So be a part of everything. One thing I, I noticed that a lot of law students, because everyone's so bogged down about being busy one hour a year, you don't participate in enough stuff. You don't go to enough events. Um, I literally was at the Women's Massachusetts Bar Association Gala last night, um, and some attorneys were telling us, oh, students don't know how to do motions. Students don't know how to file or register trademarks and copyright. And literally every student that I was sitting with that have done any of the clinics or externships, we've told them all the things that we were doing and they literally told us, you guys have a hand up and you have no idea that you have a hand up. Um, we've had attorneys that were there that were telling us we would take you right now because of what you've done, because our interns right now have never done this stuff before. Um, participate in everything. Network in everything, do it, it's great, it's fun. It's a lot of work, I'm not gonna say it's easy, it's not, um, but it's definitely worth it. I'm soft-spoken, so can you all hear me? <laughs> I'm Callie Longbell. I'm originally from Massachusetts, um, and I got my undergrad degree in marine biology and started working at a diabetes clinic um, and wanted to get back to my roots, so I was drawn to Roger Williams because of the Marine Affairs Institute, because they have the Ocean and Coastal Law Program and everything, and I wanted to get back to that. Great, wonderful. So you came here to do marine affairs, um, but while you were here, you did a few experiential opportunities. Can you tell us what those experiences were? Yes, I did three of the three. many that were listed. Um, I did the Sea Grant Law Fellow Program after my 1L year, which was awesome, and I would totally recommend it because you no offense, don't learn anything, you're one out. You learn the law, but you don't know, how, I'm sorry, you don't know how to do anything. <laughs> um, and it's a great introduction into legal research and writing, and Professor Porter is, like he said, you can ask him really stupid questions and he won't judge you. <laughs> I didn't know how to do types of citations, and I got help with that, and it, it just helped me in all of my other experiences after that. Um, which another one I did was the public interest externship at the Rhode Island Attorney General's office in the environmental unit, which you, you don't really think those two things overlap, but they really do because when I first started there, I was doing lead paint advocacy, um, 
which is obviously an environmental issue because it's lead, and you don't realize how that affects mostly low-income people who are living in the housing that has that. Um, and then I stayed there for another semester and did the environmental and land use externship to then get experience in learning. The seminars are really different where in that seminar I was able to learn more about what an environmental attorney would have to do um, and got a lot of experience with the research and regulations that you really need to know. It's, it's a really challenging area of law. Great, so that's three different experiences and you came in with a very dedicated idea of what you wanted to do. Did that pain while you were in law school or did those experiences reinforce what you wanted to do? Um, it reinforced what I wanted to do, but it also changed a little because I came into law school not caring about people at all. <laughs> and just the environment and environmental health, and I really kind of learned that environmental health and human health really go hand in hand, and they both need to care about each other. So, so you should get a heart through our program. <laughs> I came to law school and got a heart. It's usually the opposite. <laughs> Um, graduated. Yes, I took the bar exam in July and I am awaiting my results very anxiously, probably sweating right now. Um, and I am at Conservation Law Foundation, which I had done not as an externship because I wanted to get paid. <laughs> um, and I'm back there now awaiting my bar results and once I get them, I will hopefully have a job as an environmental attorney in an environmental attorney's office. <laughs> which is sort of like that pending bar result. Yes, right? yes. yes. <laughs> great, great news. Um, so if you have sort of a couple pieces of advice for these one else, what would those pieces of advice be? Um, I would definitely recommend that you try and do everything you can. And if you came to law school with a specific interest, they obviously offer something for you here, but know that you can branch out and maybe find that something else overlaps with your interest and you enjoy doing that as well and it, it opens up way more opportunities for you instead of you know focusing on one thing because after graduation you're gonna have to broaden your horizons and look for lots of jobs. <laughs> Great, thank you Kelly. Thank you. Any questions for these fabulous people up here? Okay, they told you everything. I'm not gonna ask if you have any questions for us because you can find us anytime. And it's 3.15, enjoy your extra 15 minutes. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. Thanks for hanging.